Well, the DC Extended Universe had a good run. There are plenty of good standout films that came out of the Warner Brothers' attempt at a shared universe for all of its DC superheroes, but there's a good number of missed opportunities. What, we some kind of suicide squad? This movie's gonna suck. Personally, I have to give the nod for best moment in any of the films to Wonder Woman, for the scene where she thought she killed the God of War and assumed the war would end, yet it didn't. For one single instant, the entirety of what we knew about comic book movies was flipped on its head. Wonder Woman, a literal goddess. She could punch her way out of a problem, doesn't mean she can punch her way out of every problem. And that's just life. Then we get to the actual climax of the film. Turns out she didn't beat the real Ares, and she punches her way out of this problem, and the war is over. The film had something powerful to say, but that was taken away for the sake of what someone else thought was needed for a tentpole film. It was this juggling act that was the core of what hurt the DC films the most. Everything was just one decision away from being perfect, just one flaw, either glaring or minor, kept each film from reaching its full potential. What the hell's on your face? As this chapter closes, the next one opens. The DC Extended Universe is done, long live the DC Universe. And I have faith that James Gunn and Peter Safran will give each project the proper care that each one needs. They have a long history of working together to create fantastic works of art. At this time, we have a general roadmap of how things are going to look. Of course, they're going to focus on the shared universe with the new takes on mainstays like Batman, Superman, Green Lanterns, and Wonder Woman. Some heroes that the casual audience might not be too familiar with but are still important like Booster Gold, Supergirl, and Swamp Thing. Then there's some deep cuts like The Authority and Creature Commandos. I'm actually pretty hyped about Creature Commandos and I might be like one of seven people who actually geeked out when it was announced. It's impossible to know for sure what James Gunn has planned. Unless you are James Gunn and thank you for watching. But if he needs it, there already is the perfect blueprint for how to do the DC Universe right. If you want the definitive versions of every DC hero, keep true to what made that character special, and watch them evolve over time, then I believe the new films should model themselves after the DC Animated Universe of the 90s and 2000s. Each entry into the series adds onto the other brilliantly, and in the beginning, it started out small and just worked from one well-established character, Batman, until it eventually weaved in other characters effortlessly. And by the time we get to the Justice League, we didn't need to have the entire narrative grind to a halt just to explain who exactly each character is. The universe treats its audience with the expectation that they're smarter than that, and yeah, even as a kid I understood everything perfectly fine, which is at the core something that I don't think is brought up enough with the animated series and tie-in films. They were kids' media. You're not our mom! No, but I promise you, we will find all your moms. And I'm gonna tell! But it never dumped anything down to what an adult thought a kid would grasp. Nothing ever crossed the line with the censors, of course, but man, it was close at times. Rewatching the series as an adult is an entirely new show. Not just from the innuendos, of course, but the meanings behind many of the deeper stories. We don't just get moments like Batman beating up the Joker. We get moments like Batman staying with the scared child who's about to pass away. Every show has something valuable to teach, and at least one little lesson for how to do the DC Universe correctly. It all starts with Bruce Timm and Paul Dini's Batman the Animated Series in 1992. Fresh off the theatrical releases of Tim Burton's Batman and Batman Returns, the series felt more in line with the noir film of the 40s than the typical kids cartoon of the era. While not necessarily an origin story for Batman, there were many themes that carried on to the later series, particularly Batman's self-reliance and his overconfidence. And well, he's not quite there yet. He stumbles early on and has trouble taking down regular goons in the first season, but he would rely more on his gadgets and his partners and then eventually the Cape Crusader can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with gods. The show could have an entire story arc dedicated to the villains, and they became more sympathetic because of it, even if they were still committing crimes. A scientist becomes a villain, not for greed or power, but because it's the only way to save his wife's life. Or an actor who was in a car crash becomes a test subject for medical researchers who force him to become a killer, even though all he wants to do is be normal again. And of course, the psychiatrist at Arkham Asylum who is manipulated into becoming an accomplice to the Joker. This ability to rewrite characters in a way that fans enjoyed more than the source material was one of the strengths of the show. None of these backstories were from the comics. Harley Quinn was an original character to the series. And she wasn't the only one. Characters like Grey Ghost, Detective Montoya, and even Condiment King left an impact that most fans forget that they're relatively new creations. And I think that's brilliantly done. For one, it's free real estate on rewriting character backstories from the 40s that no one will blink twice at. And the original characters can add a new dynamic to existing stories, like we've seen Dark Knight Returns a thousand times, but how would that story differ if, say, Terry McGinnis would have been there? Although the ages of Bruce Wayne and both of them don't technically line up, but you know what I mean. The show also had three films, with Mask of the Phantasm even being released theatrically. 
Bruce Timm and Paul Dini's next series was Superman the Animated Series. While Batman had a gothic, art deco look, or dark deco as it was referred to, Superman's world was far more vibrant and colorful than the Dark Knights. This time around, we did get Superman's origin story, and it's watching Clark learn that he has it in him to do better, while also wanting to shun the label of Superman just works. He just wants to help people, but the world always thinks he has something up his sleeve, particularly with the way the show portrays Lex Luthor. This version of Lex Luthor is by far the greatest iteration of the character. He's not the dastardly, mustache-twirling, cake-stealing villain of the past. He doesn't care about doing things that make him even more rich or powerful. He already is. It's seeing Superman show up and be heralded as the savior of Metropolis that drives him mad. Everything terrible with Lex Luthor plays off the best aspects of Superman. Lex wants glory. Clark just wants to help. Lex will scheme diabolical ways to take down Superman, and Clark could just easily snap him like a twig, but he never would. Lex is a hyper-intelligent titan of industry, and, and Clark is just a mild-mannered reporter. And that's another thing the show gets right. No one ever really talks about how good Clark Kent is at being an investigative journalist. Now that the terrorists have your prototype, the Pentagon is undoubtedly going to want you to build a bigger and better version for them. When all is said and done, this could net you a multi-billion dollar windfall. The show would start crossing over with Batman the Animated Series and start slowly introducing other key characters like The Flash, Kyle Rayner's Green Lantern, Aquaman, and Dr. Fate. This, plus the short-lived sequel series that played between both shows when it was aired in an hour and a half block, built a new hype for what was to come. The new Batman Superman Adventures was just a tease of what was to come later. Nothing major, but this did lay the groundwork needed to build into the Justice League and Justice League Unlimited later down the road. But more on that in a bit. There were also some spin-off shows that deserve a mention. Batman Beyond was an original creation with a futuristic look on what would happen to Batman after years of crime fighting. Bruce commits his one unforgivable act out of desperation and has to kill a criminal to save the daughter of a friend. He doesn't actually shoot the villain, but, you know, it's the thought that counts. He retires and cuts all ties to his superhero alter ego. Twenty years later, he is a bitter old man and Gotham has been taken over by crime, until young Terry McGinnis loses his father outside of a theater as well and tries to prove his worth to become the new Dark Knight Gotham deserves. While there have been many legacy characters over the years in comic books, None have really had the impact that Batman Beyond did when it first came out. Terry had his own villains to deal with, and there was still enough connective tissue to the legacy villains that also took over their respective roles, like the Joker's gang, and then having to fully address the shortcomings of the original hero. Something happened to you, didn't it? And it wasn't just that you got old. This was solidified with the series film Return of the Joker, which served as the definitive ending to the series, and after three seasons, Bruce finally fully acknowledges Terry as being worthy of taking up the mantle of Batman. And then there's the Zeta Project, which is about an assassin robot turned good with heavy themes critical of the US government and the NSA just before 9-11. Bet you can't guess why it got scrubbed from all archives. The only real lesson I can take from it is, maybe don't be afraid to experiment sometimes. But do make sure to not put too much expectations on a spinoff of a spinoff. Take setbacks on the chin and don't let it disrupt future plans. I don't know, there's a lesson in failure just how there is it with success. But the most successful of all these spinoff shows was Static Shock. Like, this show was in third place for all animated series viewership at the turn of the millennium, only behind Pokemon and Family Guy. And the show wasn't actually based off a mainline DC comic, but their subsidiary, Milestone Comics. The original series was created by the original comic book creator, Dwayne McDuffie, and it starred Virgil Hawkins, a 14-year-old who gets bullied by a local gang and is accidentally exposed to a gas that gives everyone in the area superpowers, this gives him electromagnetic manipulation and he becomes static. The first season performed exceptionally well and was meant to be its own thing, and by the premiere of season 2, Static would team up with Batman and Robin, firmly placing himself within the DCAU with many more crossovers later down the line. This show wasn't holding any punches either. There were entire episodes dedicated to topics like bullying, dyslexia, to the more serious ones that I don't think have ever been done with such a frank look in a children's cartoon, like when it covered gang warfare, school shootings, and bigotry, fans want shows with diverse characters in it. We're many years out from it, and a lot of people still hold it dear to their heart because they got to see themselves on TV on par with the rest of the other superheroes. And that means a lot to a lot of people. But of course, in a move that still bothers me to this day, it was actually canceled because it didn't have enough merchandise sales. And it wasn't really given any opportunity to sell toys because the only toy line I could find today was his promotion with Subway in 2004, but this was a great springboard for Dwayne McDuffie to later work on Teen Titans, Ben 10, The Justice League, and Justice League Unlimited. 
when you have talent like the late great Dwayne McDuffie, keep them. It's also kind of weird that the Teen Titans show was never officially in the DCAU continuity, but Batman does reference them in Static Shock. So where's Robin? With the Titans. The who? You'll meet him someday. Personally, I thought the show was canon for the longest time, but there's nothing in the text that contradicts the main series, so make of it what you will. Which brings us to the crowning jewel in the DC animated universe, Justice League and the Justice League Unlimited. Nine years in the making, we finally get the DC Trinity come together with The Flash, Hawkgirl, Green Lantern, and Martian Manhunter. This show was so iconic that people forget that Martian Manhunter was a fairly obscure character before this, and the other three weren't even the main versions of the characters that people associate with the mantles. Jon Stewart is now the main Green Lantern for Earth, Hawkgirl outshines Hawkman, and the plucky youngster of the group was actually Wally West as The Flash. Hold on a second here. What about the whole secret identity thing? I mean, I trust you guys, but I'm not sure I'm ready to- Wally West, Clark Kent, Bruce Wayne. Who in the comics was Kid Flash, and is actually still voiced by Michael Rosenbaum in the Teen Titans show. What do I have to do, rob a bank? You do that for me? I'm touched. You're not very smart, are you? So if the Teen Titans also had Dick Grayson as Robin, who we know becomes Nightwing in Batman of the Animated Series, then technically, the show was a prequel to the DC Animated Universe, and that does make sense why Destro or Slade never shows up in the Justice League shows, but never mind, it's not canon. Justice League wasn't about if the good guys will win or not. A good number of times, they didn't. The focus of the show was actually on relationships between all the heroes above all. Each episode put an emphasis on one pairing between the seven. Hawkgirl and Green Lantern had a budding romance, and so did Wonder Woman and Batman. And Superman and Martian Manhunter would eventually spend Christmas together. Yet the key relationship that has been driving this entire franchise was always been between Bruce and Clark. All the way back in Superman's show, they butted heads. Then when Superman supposedly dies, don't worry, he's sent to the future and he comes back. Batman refuses to believe this, and he works tirelessly to bring his friend back. And we finally see Bruce start breaking out of his shell. Which brings us back to the episode Wild Cards, where we can get Batman finally lose his dark aura when he's talking to Ace through her inevitable death. Batman isn't this dark and brooding force for vengeance. He's a superhero. Just like how Superman isn't some bubbling farm boy, or Green Lantern being some hard-ass marine vet. These characters all have real emotional depth that need to be explored. And then, there's Justice League Unlimited. It's a continuation of the former show with a slight format tweak to make episodes more self-contained, and it vastly increases the roster as new members are brought in. Because all the hard work was done to strengthen the audience's bond with the founding members, we can bring in all the other heroes that need more time to shine. Green Arrow and Black Canary join, and by the time we get everyone else, the audience now has someone new to love. Everything all leads us to the climactic ending, Destroyer. Darkseid returns and his eyes set on destroying Earth to finally get back at Superman. Every character is now fully realized by this point. The villains, while not necessarily redeemed, still come to Earth's defense, and all of this is needed because it makes Darkseid seem that much more powerful. Then we get the one line that defines everything that is Superman. I feel like I live in a world made of cardboard, always taking constant care not to break something, to break someone, never allowing myself to lose control, even for a moment or someone could die. He always sees the good in every little thing. He could at any moment snap and take down his opponent, but he never does. His compassion and hope for the world is what drives Superman. And when the day is finally saved by the heroic Lex Luthor of all people, even Batman shares in this optimism and allows the villains who helped save the day have a five-minute head start. The DC animated universe is special. It created something new while paying homage to the source material. It inspired people and became the versions an entire generation thinks of when it comes to these characters. There's always this idea with the DC heroes in the comics that they have to be aspirational and must be these perfect beings that you can only see in fiction. But that doesn't mean you can't make them relatable and give them genuine human moments that make us want to be better. After all, isn't that the real purpose of superheroes? But what do you guys think? What was your favorite moment from the DC Animated Universe? I'd love to hear it down below. And if you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button and subscribe for more weekly content on comic books and nerd stuff. I've been Eric, and you've been awesome.